Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the uh, final talk slot of uh, Linux ConfAU for this year. Oh, But we're going out with a bang. Here is uh, John Dalton, who will be talking to us about the joys of remote work. Please make him feel welcome. Thanks, everyone. Um, so around the middle of last year, I hit my 10-year anniversary from the first time uh, that I started working from home. Uh, when I first made the decision to do that, it was a huge jump for me. I didn't know anybody else who was doing it, um, and I didn't know if it was going to work out. I just want to get a, a quick show of hands, if I can, now. Who here is already working remotely? Excellent. And um, who's working in an office but wishes they could work remotely? That's most of the rest of you. <laughs> um, is there anyone who's working remotely but wishes they could go back to working in an office? Yes. Yes, interesting. Good. And uh, have you ever felt that the place that you wanted to live and the work that you wanted to do were in conflict with each other? Yes. <laughs> So that's the situation I found myself in, um, and I was worried that I was going to have to choose between one or the other. Um, instead, I found that there is a third choice. Uh, remote work has given me the opportunity to have a fulfilling sort of technical career, um, while at the same time being able to raise my family in Tasmania, um, which I feel is one of the most beautiful corners of the world. And research shows us that working from home is becoming much more common. Um, all over the world, but for example, in 2016, the ABS, the Australian Bureau of Statistics, released results from their Characteristics of Employment Survey, which showed that um, you know, an extra 10% of the workforce has started working from home over the past 15 years. Now, almost half of that is made up of people who are taking work home, right? So that includes any kind of um, you know, telework. That's, that's people having the ability to catch up on work, which is becoming increasingly more common. Um, and it also includes a small percentage of people whose work is based at home anyway. Um, like, they, they actually count farmers <laughs> in that. Um, but the rapid change over a short period of time in the number of people who are working at least some amount at home um, shows that for a growing number of people, it's now possible to do their job without being in the office. And if you don't need to be in the office to do your job, then maybe it doesn't matter how far away the office is, uh, or even if there is an office at all. I'm going to talk about my own experiences uh, and observations. And while I might throw one or two sort of statistics out there um, and a few holiday snaps, no, these are all pictures of, of where I live. Um, I'm not trying to claim that I'm some kind of expert on this. Um, or that I have the one true solution to remote working success. But if you've been wondering if you'd be able to do it, um, or sitting on the fence as to whether it's worth giving it a go, then hopefully I can give you a bit of a nudge uh, over the edge to go out there and give it a try. Now, I hope that doesn't come as a surprise. If you are looking for the talk where it's, you know, uh, this one man has spent 10 years working on a remote island paradise and he is done, you know, then this is the wrong place for that. Sometimes there's a temptation uh, in discussions about remote work to give people the Instagram sort of version of what it's like. Um, you know, laptop in the foreground, the sandals and the beach in the background. It's like the picture of the perfect plate where the mess that you made in the kitchen is just out of frame and the kids refusing to eat the dinner you spent three hours preparing is, <laughs> is not included in that picture either. And, you know, this talk... Um, I mean, this beach, right, is two minutes' walk from my house. Uh, I might go there at lunch sometimes, but for the most part, my work looks the same as it did when I was in an office. You know, very occasionally it's from a cafe, but I work a, a normal kind of life, so there's nothing particularly glamorous about it. And this is an opinionated, unvarnished uh, and personal tale of remote work designed, hopefully, to convince you that it's actually worth giving it a go. I want to take you back in time for a moment. Um, in the early 2000s, my wife and I were uh, trying to start a family. And we've been trying for a couple of years, and without any success, we had a string of miscarriages. We had doctors say to us, you know, you really need to maybe 
start thinking about whether this isn't going to work out. You know, you need to contemplate a future uh, in which you don't have any kids. And, you know, so we did. We started to think, well, what does that look like for us? And so we came up with all the usual ideas as well. We can travel anywhere. We can do anything we want. Uh, and we actually started going through the process of getting the paperwork to move to Dublin, which at the time was sort of heating up as a tech centre. Um, and, you know, had got our heads around the idea of, of these opportunities and this move and, you know, this change in what our life was going to look like. Um, then we got pregnant again. And, of course, everything was put completely on hold. Um, and this time it actually worked out, you know. We, our first son was born in 2005 uh, and we knew instantly that we weren't going anywhere because we'd talked about this you know, previously. We knew that wherever our life might have led us, ultimately, if we got the chance to raise a family, we were going to do that at home in Tassie with friends and family around us and what we felt was the ideal place to bring up our kids. So I refocused on work opportunities at home and life moved on. You know, we had our second son um, 17 months later. This is them at about, about that time. And by the time 2007 came around, I was feeling a bit restless and I couldn't quite put my finger on the problem. You know, we had our family, I had a good job. Uh, I was looking after the high performance computing facilities um, at the University of Tasmania, so I had interesting work to do. Um, incidentally, you can hire a machine quite a bit more powerful than that now from AWS for about 17 bucks an hour Australian. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so do, do you ever find yourself um, looking at your life and thinking that the way that you're supposed to feel about it and the way you do feel don't actually match up, right? You know, my brain was telling me that life was perfect and my gut was telling me that something was missing. And also in 2007, I'd read this book uh, called The World is Flat by Thomas L. Friedman. It's a super optimistic take on globalisation. Um, you know, it, it tells you how... By outsourcing everything non-essential, you can now make anything from anywhere in the world. And in the previous 15 years, the internet had gone from academic curiosity to completely mainstream. 2007 is the year that the iPhone came out. And so he was describing this list of forces that had caused the world to become flat. And he talks about, you know, offshoring and outsourcing, supply chain automation, all that kind of thing. But he also talked a lot about the importance of open standards like uh, SMTP, which is actually from 83 or so, I think, originally. Uh, HTTP, HTML, the web was, you know, really this big thing. And in particular, he talked about the importance of the disruptive effect that new practices like open source software and uh, global collaboration building projects like Wikipedia were having on the way that people worked and having on the world. Friedman's take on all this was pretty gung-ho on um, the whole capitalism as a force for world peace aspect. He previously had come up, in a previous book, came up with this concept uh, called the Golden Arches Theory of Conflict conflict prevention, which argued that no two countries which have a McDonald's have ever gone to war after they both got their McDonald's, <laughs> right? So yay capitalism. Um, by the time this book came out, he'd actually renamed it to the Dell Theory of Conflict Prevention. And uh, can you guess? Yeah, that's because there was some McDonald's bombing that had happened <laughs> in the intervening period. But even if there's a small chance, just a small chance that we might be on the Blade Runner timeline of the future that he was predicting, open source and mass collaborative projects have changed the world. You know, Kickstarter has put a public face on the notion that you can actually um, collaborate, design, fund and outsource the production of just about anything from just about anywhere. But in 2007, what I took from this was that if everything's going to be outsourced, I would much rather be the person they outsourced it to than the person they outsourced it from. <laughs> and if the world is flat, then the fact that I'm kind of dangling right off the bottom of it shouldn't be too, that, too much of a problem. And I realised that while I was in a good job doing interesting things, what I was passionate about was um, the future of, you know, web technology. I was worried about the 
potential for a technical career for me in Hobart. And some of my friends were already starting to move into management positions, you know, as a, as a means of career progression. I was definitely not ready for that. <laughs> I love getting my hands dirty. I wanted to play with big toys. Uh, you know, there are technical roles in Hobart. There is complex infrastructure. But because I was passionate about the web um, and nobody was doing anything at the sort of scale that I wanted to play with, uh, I realised that, you, you know, that was the problem for me, was that I couldn't do what I wanted to do where I was. Of course, thinking about it and doing something about two different things, and sometimes we need a bit of a nudge to get us moving. Um, I might not have done anything at all except for a stroke of luck. I had joined a site called Library Thing, uh, which lets you catalogue your collection of books um, shortly after they launched. And um, one day the founder, Tim Spaulding, posted this job advertisement looking for a sysadmin. The site had gotten bigger, uh, it was more complicated to run, it's growing fast, and they're looking for the first sysadmin to help them sort of get through their growing pains. The search wasn't going very well though. Um, they were looking for someone in Portland in Maine and uh, that's where Tim is based, uh, without any success. And while they searched, they continued to grow. I mean, you know, I read this job post. Um, I was already preemptively jealous of whoever got the job. And then Tim posted again, and he said, they'll pay $1,000 in credit at Amazon or the bookstore of your choice to whoever introduced them to the person they hired. Right? And check the fine print. You can recommend yourself. <laughs> So here I am sitting in my office um, in Tasmania thinking this job would be perfect. And you know what? I am the perfect candidate for this job. Pity that it's on the other side of the world, right? I mean, literally on the other side of the world. Um, they had said in that job ad that they wanted someone within driving distance of, <laughs> <laughs> of Portland, Maine, which is up there. And, uh, you know, that's me. Um, the, the actual exact opposite point is just in the water off the east <laughs> of Portland there. Um, there's a tiny little island quite close to it and one day I feel like I'd, I'd like to visit. But, uh, you know, so I knew it was possible for me to do this job from where I was because my office was directly above the data centre and I hadn't been in there in six months. And I knew that it was possible to collaborate with people because I was working as part of a a team with other research institutions around the country and we were having online meetings every week, you know. So I said to Tim something along the lines of, look, you know, I'm the right person in the wrong place, but it doesn't matter because I can do this job from Tasmania. And he didn't immediately dismiss the idea. Um, after several conversations, which took a period of a couple of months, you know, we realised we actually were serious about this and decided to give it a go. Um, if you've never worked remotely before and you're used to working in an office, um, I'll give you a heads up, it can be a pretty shocking transition. Um, you know the nervous tension you get when you start a new job, right? You really desperately want to impress people, but you're worried about it just seems, feels like it takes forever to come up to speed. You feel like you should be working at a better pace than you are. And everyone's a stranger at first, you know, and you need to learn who it is that you have to ask about different things. So who knows this part of the code base? Who knows why we do this thing the certain way that we do? You know, maybe there's a good reason for it looking like that. And so I had all that usual sort of stuff to learn, but there were other challenges that I was dealing with as well. Um, I knew I could figure out new systems and new code base. I knew I could do the work, uh, but I actually wasn't sure yet whether this was going to work out. And it's one thing to take a risk for yourself, but by this point, I was also risking my two kids, my, my wife who is now a stay-at-home mum. And so these challenges that I had to overcome um, were things like discipline. When people find out for the first time that I work remotely, almost always this is the first, uh, the first question. And in fact, uh, I got an Uber uh, this morning and the driver's chatting and he's like, you know, what are you doing? And so I tell him and yeah, sure enough, it was like, oh, you must be so disciplined. Um, and it's usually followed up by something like, I'm not sure that I would be disciplined enough to do this job. And over time, I've actually found it harder rather than easier to answer this question. Uh, because, you know, one reason, and I'm completely upfront about this, is I am not 
a very disciplined person in my mind. You know, I mean, there are people who are organised, right? Organised people have organisers, right? They have diaries. Uh, they make lists and then they cross things off those lists and they start new lists. Uh, they have colour-coded calendars. These, these people are real. Some of my best friends are organised people and these aren't random photos off the internet. Um, this is my friend Tanya, who also is a remote worker, but in the creative industry. She's an illustrator and actually the illustrator who created all the artwork for this conference, the, the branding. Um, and that's not me, right? I wish it was. I consider it a personal failing. Uh, I'm still working on it. I have a planner for this year. Uh, back in November, I decided, all right, uh, I'm going to start in December. I'm going to print out everything for December, <laughs> like do a dry run so I'm ready to go. Um, my most recent resolution was, all right, as soon as I finish writing my talk, right, then I sit down and I plan everything and I go back and I finish all of the January stuff. And so the current plan is, um, you know, and for the record, um, so you can shame me into it, I'm going to go home, I'm going to pull out all of the coloured pens that I bought <laughs> with my still empty planner. Um, I'm going to start my year off right with some New Year planning just in time for February. Um, you know, there are other types of discipline, though. And as I've spent most of the past 20 years as some variant of sysadmin, I eventually realised that I had a level of commitment to keeping things running that, you know, my wife might once have even described as pathological. <laughs> um, I don't know if you've seen this XKCD comic before, <laughs> number 705, about sysadmins. The alt text reads, the weird sense of duty really good sysadmins have can border on the sociopathic. Um, but it's nice to know that it stands between the forces of darkness and your cat blog servers. <laughs> and there, there are some jobs like sysadmin or customer support which involve a large reactive component um, where your, your plans are always tentative because it, you know that there's a possibility you're going to have to drop things to deal with something else as it comes in. As long as you've got projects and new issues coming in, you're never going to struggle with having work to do. But for that kind of work, having a ticketing system um, ensures that you can always see what needs to be done and that you can see the progress that you're making in terms of some, court, some sort of discrete unit rather than just time spent sitting in a chair, which is important for people who aren't quite as, as organised. You know, my organised friends use all kinds of different approaches. Uh, there's GTD, getting things done. Um, there's Pomodoro, Pomodoro technique. Uh, Paul Fenwick gave a talk on using Task Warrior um, in a mini comp the other day, um, which is a, a great thing to check out if you might be interested in like a command line sort of approach to task management. There's an endless list of possible approaches you can actually spend an awful lot of time reading about time management without doing any of it. Um, the Wikipedia article on time management is a good starting point. <laughs> uh, my friends tell me, though, that it's not just, not just making better use of their time that has been the benefit for them, uh, but the reduction in stress that they get as a result of that, um, which I'm keen to get on board with. So while I'll say that you don't need to be a hyper-organised, colour-coded, list-making sort of person to be successful at working remotely, you do need to have something that will get you out of bed in the morning, right? That will get you actually started on doing the work. Um, you need that sort of self-driven motivation, even if, right, even if it's just the fear of getting caught out if you don't. So another challenge with remote work is isolation. And when I first started working from home, I didn't know anybody else who was doing it. Uh, my work colleagues were all on the other side of the planet. I live in a beautiful little beachside suburb just 20 minutes out of Hobart. Um, to give some perspective on that for people who live in cities here, a 20 minute drive out of Hobart means that I can drive past wide open spaces and paddocks with horses in them before I get to my house. <laughs> um, there's an archery range, like just around the corner. So, you know, my suburb used to be shacks and, and holiday homes. And while I'm close to the city in real terms, 
Suddenly I found myself in this position where I'm in a semi-rural area for days at a time. It was not at all uncommon for me to not go further than the letterbox on our property for an entire week. You know, uh, At the weekend, as a family, there would probably be things to do. So I'd be hopping the car and then it's ferry people round to various family and kid-related engagements. But that was my, my time away from the house. Um, and there's two issues with this. Like, we all need a certain amount of adult human contact. And I've never really considered myself an extrovert. Um, but I do enjoy talking to people at least weekly. <laughs> and, you know, it's not just about socialising. It's about mental health. Loneliness and isolation are well recognised as risk factors for depression. Uh, the amount and type of contact that people need is going to vary from person to person, but I was definitely falling below my threshold. And there's another problem, and it's that I'd inadvertently cut myself off from the local tech community. Uh, these sorts of professional connections in your local community are really important, right? Because it's not just about uh, the people you have lunch with, you know, it's about being able to bounce ideas off people, um, it's about the fact that so many jobs are filled because person A knows somebody at company B um, who needs a person, you know, with a certain set of skills and they introduce them. Um, if nobody knows who you are, you will never hear about those jobs. And once I realised that this was becoming an issue, I made an effort to find ways to counteract it. Um, I still do this. It still takes conscious effort because I'm always trying to balance work, family, social, professional time. Um, at the time, a few of us started doing a uh, regular long lunch with people in the local tech community. And um, after a few years, I got too busy to keep those up. But these days, there are a couple of local tech meetups that I make sure that I get to once a month. And I do other social things, I mean, in person, but as well, I actually play Dungeons and Dragons with friends remotely. You, you can do that now too. Um, and so remote also doesn't have to mean working from home. Um, some people choose to work from a co-working space. Uh, there is one in Hobart that I keep thinking about getting a desk at, and then I think, well, I have this office that I don't pay any rent on, <laughs> you know. Um, but I do have a regular co-working arrangement with a couple of friends who actually don't work in the tech industry at all, but are remote workers, one of them sort of freelance. And, um, you know, just getting out of the house on a regular basis, whether that's working from a, a cafe or from a library. Uh, we found that the members lounge at the local museum is actually a really great place. Um, anything you need to do to get a regular dose of people the right dosage for you. Setting boundaries is crucial when you're working remotely. The most obvious example if you work from home uh, is that it can be really hard to leave work because you live at work. And what starts out as an advantage, which is the ability to do your work from anywhere, can turn into a disadvantage because you find you are doing your work from anywhere all of the time. Now, I'd got into the habit of sticking my laptop on the kitchen bench of a morning, you know, walk out, all right, laptop there, grab a coffee, quickly read through some email. Oh, look, there's a little thing that needs doing, or there's a little message that needs a reply. And it's three hours later, and I've been looking like this, and my neck is killing me, my coffee's gone cold, you know, I'm still standing at the kitchen bench, probably still in my boxes, you know. Um, so it's a really good idea to have a dedicated work space if you can. And it doesn't need to be an office. I mean, obviously, it's going to depend on the space that you have available, the kind of work that you do, right? But it's a physical area that you can say, this is the place where I do my work. And when I leave it, I've left my work behind. In that first remote role, I was a pretty typical startup sysadmin. So, I was on call 24, 7, 365. I wasn't really too fussed about where I was working from if it was three o'clock in the morning. Um, you know, if you're busy, it can be very hard to step away uh, when you know that there's plenty more work waiting for you. Internet access is obviously a, a thing that you need to spend actual conscious time thinking about, right? Um, about a year after I 
first started working from home, we decided to take a holiday for a week around New Year's. We travelled up the east coast of Tassie, which is a beautiful place I don't get to quite often enough. Bits of it are pretty remote. So I'd actually warned my workplace. I said, look, I'm going to periodically be completely out of touch. I don't want to name names, but uh, my mobile provider at the time uh, was a company that rhymes with Kodachrome. Um, and it honestly didn't occur to me that it was possible for a major network carrier to have absolutely zero mobile coverage over the entire east coast of my state, you know, which even, even 10 years ago included towns that, you know, were like tourist towns. And this is before an eccentric millionaire um, built a private museum and put Hobart on the map. So a few days of holidays um, and... The lack of coverage combined with my sysadmin spidey senses meant that I was starting to feel a bit nervous. I was having trouble relaxing. And I said to my wife, uh, look, I'm just going to duck into the online access centre. You know, it's a little publicly funded computer lab attached to libraries and, and sort of government offices in these little towns. And, uh, you know, I just want to make sure things are OK. Um, and they weren't. <laughs> things were not OK. Uh, did you know you can run putty from the folder that you extracted it into <laughs> with, with, without installing anything? Like, I'm a bit out of date as far as Windows and the desktop's concerned. Um, I hope that's, that's still true. Um, and at the time, I also allowed SSH access with password authentication, so I didn't even need to have certificates with me. And that's how I ended up spending an afternoon of my holidays at a public machine in an online access centre, putting out fires, uh, these days, I prioritise coverage over cost. In my um, mobile provider contract, I have a data plan that I can actually use to do work if I need to, um, which is, I mean, things will fail, right? Your fixed line connection will go down at some point. Um, and sometimes you don't have the option of deferring work. Sometimes you, something has to be done, you need that internet access. So multiple independent providers. Uh, I'm lucky that I can do real work with a web browser and terminal client. I have friends in creative industries who are much more reliant on a high bandwidth connection and enough quota to actually use it in order to do their jobs. Uh, this is the slide where I talk about the NBN. <laughs> <coughs> no, I'm not going to talk about the NBN. You know. <laughs> we, we had an opportunity, we squandered it. <laughs> Communication skills are crucially important um, in every field. All of our human-to-human -human protocols, uh, whether speech, writing, signing, painting, sculpture, you know, they all involve taking your thoughts and running through a sort of a lossy compression protocol. Um, communicating comes more naturally for some people than for others, but all of us can benefit from working on those skills. And occasionally taking some time to examine, you know, how we can improve the way that we communicate with other people. It's especially important in remote work because in this scenario, almost all communication is, uh, it, like it happens on purpose, right? It's intentional. You don't bump into somebody in the hallway at work. You don't happen to be sitting with someone at lunch and end up discussing a problem. You don't see the subtle physical cues, uh, you know, body language between people when you're speaking to them or when somebody else is speaking and see how the third person reacts. You miss all of that. You need to take care to be uh, explicit, to say what you mean directly but tactfully um, without expecting people to read between the lines. You need to be precise, especially if you're communicating things about process or technical concepts. Um, because even when you think you've been precise enough, there's still room for things to go wrong. Um, in that first role at the library thing, I, I organised a remote data centre move from Portland um, in Maine to Boston in Massachusetts. And, you know, it was fun, it was educational. Um, I was the only sysadmin, so, you know, there was potential for things to go wrong. I planned it out in what I thought was excruciating detail. I thought, there's no way that we can make mistakes here. And for the most part, it was good. You know, we kept the site up. There were two minor hiccups. One was that I'd used remote hands in the new data centre, and I'd given detailed instructions on how to actually, you know, rack the machines, where they needed to go, what needed to be plugged in where, and then because I couldn't get in there physically myself, I gave instructions on setting up um, remote 
access hardware with an initial password so that I could get in and do the rest. And I got the message back saying, all right, the work's been done. I try to get on, I can't get on. And in the end, I end up um, ringing them up and walking through the process and, and going through all of the docs and, and eventually managed to figure out that they had misinterpreted somewhere along the line. He just walked up and let's ignore all the details. You know, here's a screen that's asking for a password, all right? So, so what he did was configured the system itself with the carefully specified account details and password and then plugged the remote access hardware with the default and very easily Googleable <laughs> credentials <laughs> directly into the public internet. Um, and, you know, luckily I found that before any damage had been done, you know, giving random people console access to your hardware. Um, but it, it taught me that I need to be very careful about assuming any particular knowledge uh, when communicating with people. And, and that is, a, is something that requires tact because it's easy to condescend. Um, and it's easy to bamboozle. You know, finding that line is a process that takes time to learn and often takes, you know, it's actually surprisingly high bandwidth. You need to go backwards and forwards with people. Uh, the other thing that went wrong um, was my coworkers arrived at the new data center um, and uh, they drove the old equipment down in the truck. And it never occurred to me that I needed to explain that you don't use a power driver to screw things into a rack. And I was Skyped in from a laptop on a crash cart <laughs> when I, I can still remember how I felt when I heard the noise of that screwdriver spinning up in the data center. Like, aside from needing to be explicit and precise, remote work requires you to be more aware of potential cultural differences. Um, mostly it's wonderful, right? It's, uh, and it goes both ways. Uh, for example, after a decade of working with people in the USA, I now accept that maybe we don't need so many U's in all of our words. <laughs> um, and that if a word ends in I's, maybe we can just spell it that way. You know, and, and I've been able to provide useful information as well, like uh, words like avo, uh, which add colour to their vocabulary, and uh, critical, how do you live without them words, like fortnight. Um, Super quick explainer on that one for any of our overseas visitors. A fortnight is like two weeks, literally 14 nights. Um, Bi-weekly means every two weeks, I mean, every, uh, twice a week, right? There's no way that it could mean every two weeks because a fortnight is every two weeks. There's, there's no need for confusion on that one. You're welcome. <laughs> and I know now that I'm going to get grammar Nazis yelling at me on the internet. <laughs> Just don't look at the dictionary. Right, these challenges related to, um, you know, I mean, they're not unique to remote work. Um, they're universal. So you still need to be careful with, that you write clearly um, and unambiguous, unambiguously when you're sending an email to a colleague who's sitting two desks over. You're going to encounter people with diverse political, religious and cultural views um, inside an office, you know. Uh, but remote work takes the chance of a miscommunication and multiplies it and requires you to spend more conscious effort on communicating clearly with people from different cultures uh, and being more understanding about potential miscommunications that can occur. And sort of like as a special case of communication is coordination because a particular problem is coordinating with people in other time zones. There are certain time zones that are just always going to be hard for you. And the time zones are going to differ from person to person because people have different preferences. People have different availability around their own days. Um, I've worked with people in terrible time zones, for me, normally, where it was no problem at all because it happened that their preferences and mine you know, meant that we actually had quite a lot of overlap. But at times, it's going to mean early or late meetings and it's going to mean... Uh, long lags between emails, so asynchronous communication can end up really slowing down and it's something that you occasionally you're just going to have to, you, you're going to have to have inconvenient meetings to fix it. Tasmania is a wonderful place. Um, the scale of most IT infrastructure there is necessarily limited by the size of the population and there are organisations with a global customer base uh, but there's not too many of them. And so the job market is pretty small and opportunities to work on infrastructure at any sort of significant scale um, 
you know, tend to be rare. And that's what I was interested in doing. And I'm not even talking about Google scale here. I'm just mean like, you know, maybe an application that needs a dozen servers to run. Um, and over the past decade, I've had the opportunity to work with customers whose active user base was the size of the population of Australia. You know, I've had access to jobs that aren't available in the local market. Um, and it doesn't have to be jobs that are overseas either. Uh, people who work remotely can have the opportunity to stay close to family. And if one partner needs to move, maybe it means that the other partner gets to keep their job and go with them. Remote work gives people access to peers with like a wider range of experience and backgrounds. And that's really important because even if you work in the same field, you're not necessarily going to have arrived at that from the same starting place. In a small town, it's pretty easy to end up in a situation where everybody you work with has worked for the same three or four companies, you know. And like the shared background can result in unexamined biases because you've all seen things done the same ways. And the advantage of having access to people with such a wide range of backgrounds is that people bring new perspectives, um, new ideas about how to do things. There's a better chance of coming up with new ways of doing things. And it's not just technical backgrounds that matter. Like diversity of social and cultural experience is increasingly important as the um, users of the technology that we build come from a wider range of backgrounds as well. And of course, these benefits aren't just for remote workers. Uh, companies benefit from this as well. If you're struggling to find someone nearby with the right skills, then why not look further afield? You know, why take an acceptable candidate in the right place when you could maybe have the perfect candidate in an unexpected place? If you're building a product that you want to sell to the world, um, what better way to know your audience than have people in your team from around the world if you're supporting a customer base around the world, have people who share culture with the customers that they're supporting, or at least a time zone. You know, if you, um, I mean, I found it accurate. Like I found it difficult to get accurate figures on how remote work affects retention rates, um, but anecdotally, it's good news. You know, like I've been in this job for six years, which is well over six years. It's the longest I've stayed in one. It's unusual in some tech fields and I've worked with people who were there for 10 and colleagues who've worked in other remote positions often have surprisingly long tenures as well. Um, there are benefits for me personally in working remotely um, and benefits for employers but there's an economic benefit to the local economy too. And for a decade, almost my entire income has come from overseas, and that means that every cent I spend, you know, the tax I pay, everything, it goes into the local, com local community. And the skills and experience that I gain stay, stay at home. You know, in Tasmania, we have uh, a lot of concern about brain drain. Young people leave for opportunities overseas, and then, or, you know, even just interstate, often they don't come back. Sometimes it's because they don't want to, but a lot of the time it's because they can't move back and work in the field that they've developed their career in. And so when we can encourage remote work, we can allow rural uh, and remote communities to provide opportunities that they otherwise wouldn't have access to, to allow their young people to stay or to return, um, and to allow people to choose to live in the community that they want to rather than just where they need to find work. So when people ask me, how do I get a remote job? Um, I think back to how I got my first job and I say, have you tried just being really lucky and maybe a little bit overconfident? Um, you know, and I'll offer some slightly better advice than that, but there's one useful takeaway from that story and it's that a lot of, a lot of jobs could be remote if you don't take the location as being set in stone. Now, obviously, uh, you need to play this by ear. You know, there's no point suggesting a remote position at a company where they just absolutely don't do it or where you would be the only person in a different time zone and you're expected to be constant, close collaboration. Um, my second job, though, happened the way so many jobs happen, you know, um, and it was, as I mentioned before, it's person A knows somebody at company B who needs these skills and they, they introduce you. It was actually somebody that I met through the lunches that we set up um, 
as a way of avoiding isolation. And, you know, he introduced me, uh, had another conversation with some people that ended up taking several months, and I've been with Engine Yard for a little over six years. So, you know, networking was key to that position um, and other jobs that I've had. Professional networking, you know, includes stuff like going to your local meetups. Um, just being here in this room, you know, coming to this conference is a critical part of professional networking. Um, if you haven't had... Well, is, is there anyone in the room who's hiring for remote positions? Yes, that was worth a try. There you go, look. So if you're in this room and you're interested in working remotely, look around. <laughs> a couple of hands went up. Um, and so it doesn't have to be all asking everybody, can you please add me on LinkedIn and going to, you know, business brunches. So aside from like, you know, talking, talking your way into it or just having it handed to you on a plate, um, the market for advertised roles has drastically improved in the past 10 years. Uh, and I haven't generally been looking, so I spent a bit of time looking, and it's amazing. Um, the jobs boff was on the other day, and it was really great to see how many people are offering uh, remote roles. There are a couple of places, just starting points to look there. Um, the jobs page on the wiki for this conference now has most of the information from the jobs boff. Um, Stack Overflow will let you filter by location and explicitly filter for jobs that are available remotely. We work remotely, uh, lists remote positions uh, in a bunch of categories. There's not just tech jobs, there's marketing, design, customer support and more. Um, and this GitHub repo uh, has a big list of companies, including profiles of them, where they go into detail about the kind of work they do and the kind of people they're looking for. So it's worth having a look um, at those. When I started doing this 10 years ago, everyone wanted to know what kind of software we use to collaborate remotely. Um, and so since then, you know, so many more tools have become available. There's so many, the risk isn't whether you can find the right tool that works, the risk is using too many of them, right? Um, here's a handful. So this is just chat and instant messaging. You know, Slack is the, the clear winner. I use it. I am actually a fan, but it's not open source. Uh, IRC works fine, right? Um, Riot, uh, Riot.im and Matrix, uh, probably if you've been using conference chat, then you might have either used that or seen people bridged into IRC who are using Matrix. It's a much more modern approach. And Mattermost, I haven't used, but it looks really interesting. They're basically trying to build an open source Slack alternative and they provide, um, you know, enterprise hosting as well. Um, collaborative editing, you, you will have to do, and of course that's not just remote workers, but um, Etherpad is, I've used it, it was, it's really sort of lightweight and fast. Um, Google Docs is the opposite of those things, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's not open source, but people can use it without installing anything. And documentation, I mean, again, this is not about remote work, everybody has to do this, but it's, you're going to rely on it even more. Use a wiki, everybody knows that now, hopefully. I've become a fan lately of just using plain markdown in a Git repository. If you stick that on GitHub, they render it really nicely, you have a beautiful web UI, and you can even edit it inside the interface. But you also have the ability to keep that offline, have access to it when you've got no access, um, to edit it remotely and sync it up later. Um, you need to use a shared calendar. Reminder bots are nice. Um, Slack has them. And of course, you know, there's dozens now already for Matrix. I use this website called Every Time Zone several times a day because one thing I've learned is that no matter how well I think my brain understands the concept of time zones, which is like, you know, um, it's just never going to get these calculations right. Okay? And daylight savings doesn't happen once. It happens like six times a year for me <laughs> because it doesn't happen at the same time and you're moving in different directions. I don't even try anymore to do this in my head. That's a great tool. Keep it simple though, right? It doesn't matter that you find the perfect tools. Like if you're joining an established company, then it's probably going to be dictated to you. But if you have the opportunity to do it, um, then my advice is to pick a small number of great tools that aren't actively user hostile. So to pull all this together then, after a decade of uh, working remotely, it's pretty clear to me now that the technical challenges are basically solved, right? This is a people problem. We have the ability to do it. 
Um, it doesn't work perfectly. Video conferencing still sucks on a pretty regular basis. But when I think about what it really takes to make it work, top of the list are ideas about how we work together as people, right? So my, my sort of top four points, be visible, and it goes both ways. Uh, if you're a manager, you need to make sure um, that people know you're there, right? And if you're working, you need to do more than just hand in work. Uh, go home at the end of the day, right? Leave your work. Make time for networking. It's crucially important. And remember, remote people are real people. They're not just names at the end of an email conversation. Uh, one day you might meet those people. It's Sonia, who I worked with for four years without meeting any of my coworkers until we were both in different jobs and happened to be in San Francisco at the same time. Um, this is my coworker Diego, who I started working with several months ago and met on Wednesday for coffee. And he has moved from Brazil to Sydney. This is the first time in 10 years that I've had a coworker in the same country. <laughs> so, you know, this is why I do it, right? This is my family. Um, you know, Thomas Friedman was all about uh, globalization as a force for peace, but I think there's more to it than that. I think that um, rather than the fear of lost trade, we can look at the things that we do without using profit as a primary incentive. And the open source approach has allowed people to build uh, amazing things together. And remote working has naturally been a part of that community, is now coming out into the world. I think that also can be more than just convenience for workers, but a force for peace, as, you know, a way for us to get to know each other. I hope that uh, if you've been thinking about taking the plunge, that uh, this is the nudge that will push you over the edge. Uh, luck and coincidence played a really big part in me getting my role, but if I can do anything to help even just one other person make that jump, then I would consider that a win. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you again, John. Uh, we do not have time for questions, unfortunately. If you do want to uh, bend John's ear about anything in particular, um, please try and find him out in the hallway. Um, there is.